today on CityCast Houston. Raise your hand if you've been here before. You take an entire day to plant new flowers, veggies, and fruits in your garden for spring. But in a few days, you go outside and everything is dead. You can't see it, but I'm raising my hand like a lot of you. That's why I'm getting advice on the best things to plant in H-Town for Brent Moon, Houston Botanic Garden's horticulture manager. And that title just means he's really good at growing stuff in Houston. It's Thursday, April 11th. I'm Rahil Ramzanali, and here's what Houston's talking about. Brent, welcome into CityCast Houston. How are you? Doing well today. How are you? I am doing great. So before we jump into all sorts of tips and advice from you, you obviously have a green thumb, right? Because you do this for a living. So at home, are you just growing your own vegetables and fruits year-round? Pretty much, yeah. I do have a vegetable garden and I always, pretty much always have something going in it. And so, in fact, I'm I'm late this year because we we got hit by that storm that went through south of here about three weeks ago. So, I'm about a month late on my vegetable garden, but I did finally just finish it yesterday. Nice. Good job. So, then you're going to be living off the land here in the next few months, right? Yep. Try to. That is so cool. So, for homeowners around the area, this is the time where we're all thinking about all right, I need to plant something. I need to clean up my garden. And as you mentioned, we might be a little bit late right now, but let's start with the basics, right? Like what are some things that homeowners should be doing right now for upkeep of their gardens? So I guess if you're thinking about your landscape, you know, now is a great time to make sure it's all weeded. Uh, If you want to put down a little bit of compost to sort of supplement the nutrients in your bed, it's always great to do that. And just to get it mulched before the heat of summer gets here, because that'll help moderate soil temperatures, help, you know, prevent weed growth and help hold in moisture. So uh, this is the sort of the time of year I always shoot for mulching. I have a lot of live oaks around my landscape, so I tend to try to wait till the leaf drop is finished and the catkins are finished and then I mulch after that. Nice. So with the grass, is this a good time to put down some fertilizer or some weed and feed? Like what do we do here? Because that's always so confusing when to put that down this time of the year. Yeah. And of course, there's, you know, as many opinions on that as there are horticulturists in the world. (laughs) So personally, I I have used weed and feed in the past. I'm not not going to say I haven't. I'm not really a big proponent of it as much these days because there's a little bit of sort of like mistiming on the two different things because you have two different things going. You have the weed aspect of it, which is a pre-emergent and then the feed, which is the fertilizer. And really to get the the pre-emergent portion of it out when you need to, you need to do that, of course, before the weeds germinate. And so if you're putting that out, then you're really applying the fertilizer earlier than your warm season grasses are ready to start utilizing it because they're still in sort of semi-dormancy. So I just sort of advocate more for using a good slow release fertilizer this time of year for things like, you know, your Bermuda and St. Augustine grasses because they're starting to wake up. So they could use a little bit of extra nutrients generally. But yeah, so the weed and feed is really sort of personal preference. So I've always heard that just using a good fertilizer is the best move, right? Because it'll just crowd out the weeds. Is that true? Right. Yep. Making sure you, you know, mow at proper heights, you know, so that you're not scalping your lawn. That helps shade the weeds out. Again, it sort of it sort of acts like the mulch does. Having that higher grass height helps to shade the soil level. And so then that sort of, it, it conserves moisture for your turf grass roots. And then it also inhibits um, germination of weed seed because there's less sunlight getting to the soil. Gotcha. Now, anytime I go to a big box store, right, Home Depot, Walmart, even H-E-B now, there's just so many plants out there. Mm -hmm. And this is that time of the year, as I mentioned, where we're getting back into it. We're going outside. The weather's great. You want to do some gardening. And I'm a total beginner. I I do it every year and I am not good at this. Okay. So that's why (laughs) personally, I'm having you on just to help me out more than anything. But when we're thinking about plants right now, what are some good plants you recommend that will not only look good, but also survive the Houston summer because everything died last year. Yeah, it was a, we've had a couple of drought years in a row, you know, and even here at, for us at the Botanic Garden, it's, it was a struggle, you know, we have irrigation on a lot of things, but you know, if it's just tough on the plants, tough on the plants as it is on the people. So, um, I mean, when you're thinking about landscape plants, for instance, you know, if you want to think about things that really will thrive in the summer heat, you know, all, all of your native plants are certainly always good choices. You know, some of the perennials, things like salvia do really well because they're just adapted. They like the, they like hot and dry 
high. And most of them, as long as you have decently uh, well-draining soil, they'll they'll do okay even if we get a lot of rain that year. But salvias do tend to like it on the dry side. So that's always one of the plants that I that I think of as, as a great summer perennial is there's many different salvias. Um, when it comes to vegetable gardening, you want to think about things that are that really like the heat. So really um, I won't say you've missed the windows for tomatoes because I just optimistically went ahead and planted mine. But typically, sometimes I've planted tomatoes here as early as the very end of February, um, very beginning of March. So tomatoes like to, to be planted early so that they can set their fruit before it gets too hot. Once we start getting those high nighttime temperatures and daytime temperatures like in the upper and mid 80s, the, the pollen actually becomes sterile and they don't set fruit anymore, which is why you see tomato production really drop off when it gets super hot. Even though they're from the tropics, they don't like those super high temperatures. So it um, should be okay if people go ahead and plant tomatoes now. But really thinking about things that really are going to thrive in the heat. Things like pepper, eggplant, squash, uh, melons, bush beans, green beans, okra. Things like that that just love and thrive in you know the heat. They'll all do well in the Houston summers here. As far as you know, sort of sticking in that same vein of vegetable um, production, you want to avoid really your, your more cool season stuff now because they're really not going to get any cooler from this point forward till about October. So, like I wouldn't waste my money planting things like you know cabbage, lettuce, you know radishes, spinach. They all are really more cool season, and that's really the key to understanding. You know, if you're maybe if you're struggling at home with your plants, you really want to understand what what's a cool season plant and what's a warm season plant because you know you're just you're setting yourself up for failure if you're trying to plant things that really like like you wouldn't go in right now saying fill your flower beds full of pansies or ornamental cabbage because they're just going to hate the up, upcoming conditions mm, gotcha so you really need to know the difference in cool season and warm season and what likes the sun and what needs the shade how about flowers what are some good recommendations right now with the upcoming heat mm-hmm Yep. So you've got a little bit of time left that you could get some, you know, some nice uh, show out of things like petunias and geraniums. Um, to me, if you don't already have those in, I would just skip spring and go straight to summer flowers. That's sort of what we're doing here and what I typically do at home. So things like um, vinca, which also called periwinkle, again, uh, different kinds of salvias, zinnias. Um, there's a plant called angelonia that's really good. All of those are just great for the summer heat here. Nice. Okay. Now I told you, I, I'm going to ask you a lot of beginner questions. Okay. So when you're planting these flowers, these vegetables, and I, I know this is going to vary for each one, but this is a simple one. Like how deep should the hole be when you buy a a plant from a store, right? That's already in a pot and then you're transferring it over. Like how deep should that hole be? Yep. I'm going to say typically not as deep as people dig. People tend to plant things too deep, especially when it comes to trees or shrubs. Oftentimes you can even, when you knock the plant out of the pot, if you look, lots of times you'll have two to three inches of soil going up on the trunk of that tree or shrub. And that's not a good thing. So you want to knock all that off to you sort of see like where the roots actually start. And typically when you dig a hole, you want to shoot for it to be um, where maybe the top of the root ball is maybe an inch above grade when you finish planting. And then you'll sort of mulch up over the top of that while keeping the mulch away from the main stem by a few inches. And then you typically want to aim for your hole to be twice as wide as the pot that the plant came in. Gotcha. And that just sort of loosens up that area around it gives the roots something to fairly easily root out into. So you never want to make it the exact same size of the pot and sort of cork it in there, you know, because then you're just constricting those roots and they have trouble branching out. Oh, that makes sense. How often should we water new plants? It sounds like a smart aleck answer, but as often as they need it. So okay. <laughs> well, basically what I shoot for and sort of what I uh, sort of tried to teach the crew here is when, when you transplant, you know, and you plant it sort of like a little baby you're putting out there. It doesn't matter if, you know, if it's a six or seven foot tree or, or a little, you know, four inch pot, they're going to need water fairly frequently to begin with because their root zone's just right there. It's not like a mature tree or shrub where the root zone is really spread out. So we always recommend watering at the time of planting. Um, that's probably fine for that day typically check it the next day and if it doesn't seem like it's wilting or anything you can probably wait until the next day to me a good rule of thumb just sort of for our weather around here let's say we didn't get any rain that week i would probably shoot for watering something three to four times a week and you water it you know long and deeply don't give it a quick squirt and you're done water it thoroughly to make sure you're getting the root zone in the area around it really saturated and then sort of every week after that you can slightly back off on your watering and within four to six weeks you should be maybe only watering it maybe once a week if we get a little rain once every other week. But it, it's very dependent on soils and what the plant is, too. Some are much more particular than others. So it, it's hard to give a good concrete answer to that. That's sort of where the green thumb and experience comes in. 
Yeah, and that's it, right? Like everything varies. So I definitely understand that. I'll, I'll, I'll be hitting you up or I'll be hitting Google up and trying to find these answers as well. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by ShipStation. If you run an e-commerce business, you know how much work it takes to produce something great while dealing with complicated shipping issues. That's why over 130,000 companies have turned to ShipStation, an innovative tool that allows you to focus less on shipping and more on building your brand. With ShipStation, you can manage orders, label printing, reporting, and customer service on one easy-to-use dashboard. You'll reduce warehouse costs with reliable enterprise solutions and save thousands on shipping costs with discounts up to 89% off. Plus, you can effortlessly import orders from everywhere you sell online. So, turn your shipping challenges into opportunities for growth. Go to ShipStation.com and use code POD to sign up for your free 60-day trial. That's ShipStation.com, code POD. Now, with planting soil, is that enough or should we be putting something else in when we're putting a new plant into our flower beds or gardens up front? So if you're planting into the ground, say you're planting a tree or shrub, I always recommend just backfilling with the native soil, what's there, you know, already. Um, and there's a few caveats to that. One of the reasons for that is if you make the soil too nice, it's sort of like us at home. If you're, you know, in your bed or you're with your nice blankie, you feel soft and warm and secure. You don't really want to get up and move around, right? It, it's sort of the same way if you create great conditions with soil, like say you completely excavate the hole, put in a lot of nice, you know, peat moss and compost the roots are going to really fill that area up and they're going to be loving it and they're really not going to want to explore out a lot beyond that which isn't really great for the plant you want the roots to go as far and deep as possible so the caveat to that would be if you have some really just terrible clay gumbo soil which i know a lot of us do in the houston area maybe if you're a little further north here you get a little bit of sand so i'd say if you have a lot of sand or a lot of clay it's probably a good idea to mend with a little bit of um peat moss or compost just to sort of help provide some nutrients and sort of some different structure to the soil. You want the soil to be a little more friable, have some good air pockets in the case with clay. Clay is very dense, very densely packed, and that's why it doesn't drain well. So if you can mix a little bit of organic matter, a lot of compost in there, it really opens the pores up, helps the soil breathe better, which is one of the keys to plant health. The roots have to be able to breathe, soil needs to drain. And then on the other end of the spectrum, if you have a very heavily uh, sandy soil, the water water and nutrients just want to flush right through because those pores are bigger with sand. So you work some organic matter in there. It increases the water holding capacity and the nutrient holding capacity of that soil. So let's do a project here with CityCast Houston, right? So with everyone listening right now, recommend one fruit and one vegetable that we should start right now and kind of give us a, a three-month plan. Like how should we get started? And three months from now, we're like going, yes, we nailed this. Let's start with the vegetable. Okay. Do you have a favorite one? Let's go with peppers. Okay. So peppers, that's a good one because it's fairly easy. <laughs> They're almost a plant and forget as long as you keep them watered. <laughs> so yeah, let's say like for for my example, like I started some from seed back in January at home and then I also bought a couple four inch plants. So, you know, they're maybe eight or 10 inches tall right now. So, you know, I, I dig a nice hole. Like I, I tilled up my garden, added some organic matter, like we talked about, dig the hole plant the pepper and water it in. I'll probably stake it just so it doesn't flop around in the wind a whole lot and start falling over once it starts setting fruit and getting heavy. Usually about a week in, I tend to wait about a week so the roots start branching out just a little bit. I'll give it a little bit of um, water-soluble fertilizer. You could also use a granular that you just water in. You know, with peppers, it's basically just sort of keeping an eye on their growth, um, seeing when they need fertilizer. They shouldn't need to be fertilized more than about once a month, but if you're really looking for some good production, you know, you, you might could you might could bump that up to every three weeks. It really depends on what your soil nutrients are like. Okay. But um, with peppers, you're basically just waiting for the harvest at that point. You know, watch out for any pests, of course. Um, peppers generally don't get too many around here. So peppers are a pretty carefree one. Nice. And as far as um, a fruit, let's see, what's a good one? 
Mm, I'm going to go with bananas just because that's something that, that's sort of one of my specialties. I don't know if you've ever been out here before. We always have a banana fest here or go, go banana fest here at Houston Botanic Garden. I'm going to plug that one for you. Um, but bananas, you know, some people I think around here maybe just sort of think of them almost as weeds because they're so common, but they're super easy to grow and there's so many different varieties. It's just like apples and tomatoes. There are so many different kinds and commercially you get one or two, you know, at best in the grocery stores. But if you start with a small banana from a pot, say a two or three gallon pot or just a little sucker or a pup that someone gives you, you'll be amazed how fast that thing grows. Once it sort of gets established, you can almost watch it put out a leaf a week. You can almost watch them grow. Wow. So bananas are a little more long-term investment, of course. They they tend to need close to a full growing season before they will flower and fruit. But it's definitely um, achievable for the home gardener to get fruit here um, in the Houston area. Gosh. So I planted a banana tree when we moved into our old home and I never got any fruit from it. So I got so frustrated. I just took it down one day. I was like, enough. I, right. I'm not getting anything here. Yeah. Well, and they, they do, you know, sort of need some conditions to be met. Of course, they're ultra tropical plants. So, you know, if it freezes, they obviously don't like it. I mean, we've lost ours to the ground multiple times here at the Botanic Garden. But surprisingly, we have such a long growing season. They've come back and flowered and fruited both years, which has surprised me because in my experience in the past, they need a little more time than that. Um, it is possible also that you might have gotten a banana that's strictly ornamental. There are certain ones that, although they will fruit, they'll produce, you know, little fruit that are two or three inches long, maybe the size of your finger, and they'll have some little seeds in them, you know. So they're they're really grown more for their either the effect of their foliage or their flowers themselves or the bracts and not necessarily the fruit. So it's possible you could have gotten one of those. Hey, possible. One last thing with the homeowners. Should we buy bagged mulch or should we get fresh mulch from a local nursery? Right now is a perfect time to remulch. So which one should we get? Right. So it's really sort of personal preference um, on that. Um, getting bulk mulch from a nursery is typically uh, a little going to be more cost effective, going to be a little cheaper if you could get them to deliver. Maybe you need like three or four yards, just have them bring it in a small dump truck and dump it. One thing I would say is you mentioned fresh mulch. So that's sort of the key. You do not want fresh mulch because that means it hasn't been aged. You want to ask uh, if you're going to go to a, a soil yard or nursery and get mulch, you may want to ask them, hey, you know, how, how long has this mulch been aged? Because if it's something they have just freshly ground up and, and most most people are pretty reputable and they're not going to sell you something that's uh, that's still what we call green because it has to go through a bit of an aging and decomposition process. And if you put that over your plants and in your landscape and it's too thick, as it breaks down and heats up, it can actually damage your plant some. And it also ties up nitrogen for a while as it goes through that aging process. So you want to make sure you get some aged mulch, probably something that's been sitting around, you know, four or five months. And then I would also caution people, and again, this is very much personal preference. A lot of people feel really strongly about this one way or the other. I would go for some kind of native, and when I say that, I sort of mean the the non-dyed or traditional mulch. Like you see the red mulches, and there are some that are dyed black. Those are full of different compounds that they use to dye that. It, it goes away anyhow. The red mulch to me is particularly odd because it looks very bright and fresh when you first put it out. And within a few days of being exposed to the sun, that color starts breaking down, get a few rainstorms on it, and then it just looks faded. But to me, the worst thing is you're putting all these chemicals into the ground that you don't really know what they are. So I always just try to go with your traditional like regular hardwood or pine mulch. Let's do pest control real quickly, if you don't mind, because look, I don't want to spray a bunch of chemicals all over my lawn. My pets are on there. My kids are on there. Give me some good tips about organic ways to control those pests, those annoying ants, other yep. bugs, right? There's just <laughs> right. so many out there. Yep. You know, it's funny. I rarely, I've been doing this, like I mentioned to you, for going on 30 years now. And it's very rare that I have to pull out the, the big guns, you know, as we say, as far as some kind of harsh chemicals. You know, sometimes you can take care of things just with a blast of water. You get your hose out and your nozzle like you would wash your car with and just give your plants a good blast. And that'll dislodge a lot of pests, particularly if we have a really hot, dry year and spot. Spider mites are bad. Spider mites hate water. So if you blast your plants occasionally with some water, that takes care of a lot of things. But you can do a lot of um, treatments that are a lot less harsh, things like insecticidal soap, where you take a gallon of water and you put a little bit of, of like a drip or two of dishwashing liquid in there. It sort of acts as a surfactant, which means it sort of spreads and sticks to the leaves and also therefore the insects. It sort of smothers them. You can mix some orange oil with that and it has a nice, really pleasant smell. Basically, it sort of smothers the insects. So if you use orange oil, and sometimes I've even put a little bit of isopropyl alcohol in there because that helps dry the insects out as well.
well. Neem oil is another. It's a it's a biocontrol. It's from the neem tree. So th- those are some good things to try to just uh, take care of a you know sort of a, a non synthetic way of taking care of some of your pests. Nice. That's really cool. Now all of our listeners aren't homeowners, right? So we've got people in apartments and townhomes. And they want plants inside. Give us some recommendations on some good plants that we should be getting right now for the Houston weather. Even though it's climate controlled, it it does get a little hot inside. Right. Yep, it can. So, you know, unless you've got some kind of awesome grow light set up, you're going to be looking for plants that like a little bit lower light conditions, things like Sansevieria, which is also called mother-in-law's tongue. Lots of different types of monsteras out there now, Um, ficus. Peperomia. Uh, there's some smaller palms that do well indoors. Some of the Camadoria palms do pretty well. It's also called bamboo palm. Um, of course, orchids, if you have bright indirect light, like an east or north facing window, orchids do pretty well. And then, of course, cacti and succulents do great indoors if you have a south or southwest facing window. They like as much light as possible. And I always recommend to people, if, if you have a patio, um, you know, cactus are great to grow out. Cacti and succulents are great to grow out on your patio if it's full sun. But I move all my orchids and all of my pretty much all of my house plants, I move outside in the summer because it simulates what where most of them come from, which are tropical rainforests. And I just sort of keep them in a shady area. Like I have some palm trees around my pool at home. And like I mentioned before, I have a lot of live oaks. And so my orchids do great out there. All of my house plants basically go out on my back patio nice. where they can get the humidity and, you know, the frequent rainfalls that we typically get here in Houston. Nice. So, yeah, they get they get a little taste of home mm-hmm. for once. Exactly. Yeah. People just need to acclimate them slowly. If they've been inside all winter, definitely don't stick them straight out in the sun. They'll burn just like a person will going to the beach for the first time in the summer. So you <laughs> sort of have to slowly acclimate them to the conditions. Okay, Brent, before we get out of here, if this is really overwhelming for a listener, do you all do classes at the Houston Botanic Garden that we can attend and kind of find that green thumb? Yep, we absolutely do. So we have an awesome education department here who always has tons of great classes coming up. Um, Later on in June, we'll actually be having a sort of a all day seminar where some of our horticulture staff will be speaking. I may be speaking at it possibly as well. But yeah, there's always great uh, classes here that people can attend and just uh, walk around the garden, you know, and it can inspire you for things you can do at home. So if anybody has any um, questions or interested in that, just go to our website at HBG for Houston Botanic garden.org and go to the um, events or education page and you'll find all that info. I love that. Brent, thank you so much for joining us and sharing this knowledge with us. Absolutely. It was fun. Thank you. That was Brent Moon. You can learn more about the classes and events at Houston Botanic Garden with the link in our show notes. And if you have that perfect garden that you want to show off, send us a picture on Instagram at CityCast Houston. That will do it for today. Thank you for listening, and I hope you learned something new. Plant the hole, or I'm sorry, dig the hole.